Thanks for coming on a Thursday. Uh, today what we're going to talk about is um, a little bit of our process, some of the spots and uh, main titles that we've worked on, but also, um, can, can I see a show of hands? Who's a student here? Or who, who's recently graduated? Okay, so about half maybe. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about, which I think a lot of people kind of struggle with or go through when they're in school or when they're just out of school is trying to figure out what drives them, what, what kind of work they want to do. So one of the reasons why we're here today is to show you uh, a, a different type of work that is heavily 3D based, but it might not come to the forefront of your minds when you start thinking about mm, what creative opportunities you have. So here as well is to open your eyes and make you realize there's a ton of creative, cool projects out there that you might not be aware of. Um, so for the, the we're going to title, we, we tried to come up with a good title for this. And all of us put our heads together, and we came up with this, Creativity is King, uh, a journey of creative fulfillment and growth. And we were like, eh. <laughs> Seems a little, eh. So Mr. Wolkoff over there decided to consult his best friend, Chat GPT, and we ran this for 14 variations, and it came up with all of these. And we were like, cool. Um, and after all of that, we decided the title of our show should be Creativity is King, <laughs> A Journey of Creative Fulfillment and Growth. <clears throat> but we tried. Um, let me introduce you to the other guys here. Uh, I'm Kirk Shintani, uh, I'm a creative director at Make Make. Uh, Mr. Wilkoff, Andy Wilkoff, who's the head of 3D, and then uh, Mr. Mike Bettinardi, who's a VFX artist. Um, so just to kind of kick things off a little bit, we'll talk a little bit about Make Make. You guys can jump in at any time. Sure, no problem. Any time. You're, you're doing great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Keep going. <laughs> um, so Make Make is actually comprised of six separate companies. Um, Make Make Entertainment, which is kind of the development portion of what we do. Uh, they're responsible for unique IP, um, you know, production and those sort of things. Uh, you'll see Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is our editorial department. Um, <clears throat> the owner of the company actually started Rock, Paper, Scissors first. Um, and he's won Oscars for a couple movies in recent memory, so he's been around for a while. Uh, then we have A52, which is our visual effects arm. We do a lot of um, heavy compositing, live action, uh, integration, um, heavy photo reel CG, that sort of thing. Uh, Primary is our, our, color, uh, our color grading department, and they handle film, TV, commercials, music videos. Um, Elastic is our design and directorial uh, branch, so anything that's design-based. Um, a lot of the main titles come through Elastic. Um, that's what they do. And then Jax does all of our trailer and marketing. Um, so uh, they handle a lot of the Warner Brothers uh, movie trailers that you've seen uh, came out of Jax. Uh, and Indestructible does mu music supervision and sound design for all the departments. Um, so we're kind of like all inclusive in terms of what we do. Yeah, right? yeah, it's a nice little campus. Yeah, and um, so like the three of us were in the 3D department or you were. I, w I was in the 3D <laughs> department. Um, and the 3D department basically services all the, the different branches. So, um, you know, I think we've all worked on different trailer kind of graphics, mm -hmm. and we've worked on main titles, and we've worked on what else? Commercials. Game cinematics. Game yeah. cinematics, music Special videos. venue events. Yeah, like in, uh, installations too. <coughs> So, you know, it, it, it's kind of cool because we get to do a bunch of different things. Um, and then one of the things about Make Make that I think is important to kind of mention, <clears throat> when you guys think of a company like Make Make that's generally for television um, and commercials and that sort of thing, what, what is the first thing that pops in your head? It's probably live action commercial, photo real CG, um, you know, <coughs> Super Bowl spots and that sort of thing. But for us, we have a really heavy design component to our company. Um, and we look at 3D not just as a visual effects tool or a gaming tool or a, a real-time tool. It, it's a pencil. 
So we kind of look at it as a design tool, a tool to generate imagery in whatever style that you want. Um, and our job is to really kind of explore that. It's not necessarily to get stuck in one specific type of work. Um, it's about being creative and exploring what's possible. Um, so I think, you know, for us, that's something that we, we heavily lean on in, in a lot of our work. Um, so I'm sure these guys will say the same thing. The, the amount of work that we do and how eclectic it is. is yeah, is it's pretty, it, you know, unreal. it's a bit of a roller coaster because a lot of times it's, for hire agency directors and we're executing and helping explore the, and bring their vision. And then sometimes we're generating that, that vision in house and having a bit more collaborative of a back and forth trying to find things. So a, a good part of our process is like you said, is, is, is not doing ABC, but it's a very creative collaborative process to find what the, uh, the end product is. Yeah, I think um, the next thing we're going to show is our, we're going to show two reels. One is our general reel, uh, and then the other one is our main title reel. So um, you'll kind of see how eclectic the, the type of work that we do is. Um, so let's play that. Unclean, unsound, ever. 
So that kind of gives you an idea of the breadth of our work. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that kind of runs in parallel with the evolution of our company is the evolution of the people that work there. Um, one of the things that we try and do uh, is make sure that everybody finds their creative path um, and is able to push themselves in, into new arenas and areas that maybe they want to try, um, but they haven't had an opportunity to. So. With that comes kind of our own personal journeys. And the three of us were talking uh, all week about, like, well, how long have you been here now? Like, how long has it been? It's like, and then where did you long. go? Like, wh yeah. where did you go to school? And yeah. like, stuff that we've kind of mentioned in passing. Like, we've worked together for a long time. Um, but we never really kind of dove into it and actually talked about it. So it was, it was kind of enlightening for us, too to talk about it. So, you know, some of the basic stuff is like, um, like what was your path? Um, what was your first job in 3D? And what's the favorite thing you worked on and why? I don't know, you wanna kick it off, Volkov? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I can go first. So, I'm probably a little bit more senior than, than you guys and, and rings around the trunk. So, when I, um, I graduated high school in 92 so I've always wanted to be in the movies, and I'm from Ohio, and basically 
went to school at the University of Cincinnati, which is the first, furthest thing <laughs> away from Youngstown, just because I wanted to get as far away as I could, and I had to stay in the state. Um, and I kind of fell into the, uh, the industrial design program. And it was a real big eye-opener for me because I didn't realize you can make money doing art. And, you know, design, or at least industrial design, is a, is a big mix of, of art and engineering and being able to interface with people with different skills. But I always had this passion for, you know, Star Wars, Jurassic Park, like all that kind of stuff. And where I wanted to go is I wanted to go into pre-production. I wanted to be the guy, you really? know, I'm looking at all the arts of Star Wars. And you wanted to do pre-production? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> that, that design path was taking me, I wanted, well, what I thought I wanted to do was go in, into pre-production. So, you know, I'm, I got all those making of books and, you know, looking at the storyboards. and, and those Yeah, things. and just seeing, like, the sketches of the sets and, you know, the vehicles and all of I'm like, I want to do that. And... And in the design program, there were a few people that actually broke through and did it. Uh, George Hall and uh, Scott Liebrecht were both alums of Cincinnati and were at ILM. And I had a, another couple buddies that were a year ahead of me. They were like two or three years ahead of me. And there was one just ahead of me who went more into computer graphics. And uh, University of Cincinnati is a co-op program. So after the sophomore year, every other quarter you're getting a job in a design firm, essentially a paid internship, and you're going anywhere in the country, and you're working for three months, and you're coming back to school, and you're working for three months. And my last round of co-op, I wanted to get, I was talking to Scott Liebrich, and I wanted to get the ILM summer art department internship, which is basically photocopying, cutting mat boards, and, and mounting stuff, right? And it was unpaid, and I was broke, and I had, like, no money. I'm like, if I get this thing, I'm going to be living in my car. Um, so I went out for it, and I made this, made my portfolio, and I made it to the final round, but I didn't get chosen. Uh -huh. And, yeah, it was, I was, there was three people left, and it was just me and two other people, and someone else got chosen. <laughs> it's probably good, because I didn't, literally, I didn't know how I was going to live. So um, from there, I reached out to my other buddy who was working at a, a company called Digital Muse in Santa Monica oh, yeah. and basically begged him for a summer internship. So yeah. for people who don't know, can you talk about what Digital Muse does? So did? Digital Muse um, was kind of, it was an offshoot of Amblin and they worked on, um, it was that deep sea, there, there was an underwater show that was done in Amblin. And then they broke off and started their own company, and they were working on Star Trek, Voyager, Deep Space Nine. They were doing television so commercials. So epi episodics. So epi television episodic okay. work. And so I got a, a summer internship out there. And what led me that way a little bit is as I started getting up in the design field, a lot of Alias Studio and stuff was becoming more computer aided CAD stuff. So I was like the lab nerd and, you know, really getting into kind of the computer aided design. And so I was kind of gravitating towards that. So I came out, luckily they gave me an internship and they're like, we use LightWave. I'm like, what's that? And they're like, we use polygons. I'm like, polygons? You don't use NURBS? And, you know, um, so basically I learned LightWave from the guys that wrote the manual. And then from there, I moved on to um, uh, work on uh, Starship Troopers, uh, Roughnecks, the mm. animated television show, and then the digital domain for a big stint, and um, commercials and features. And in a roundabout way, kind of made my way over to, uh, to Make Make. So what is it, uh, in terms of um, the types of companies that you ended up working at, um, it, it sounds like it was episodic and some film. It was episodic and, and like feature. Digital domain was was heavily you know commercials, and then I jumped to features for many years and kind of had my fill of that. 
you know, uh, it's just, it's a different kind of work, especially when when I was doing it, you know, a big show was 500 shots and you had like eight or nine months to do it. Yeah. So, um, but it, it was challenging. It was, you know, it was like a whole other level of education as well because there wasn't a big pervasiveness of, of schools. And, you know, I worked with people that came from JPL and designed modules from the spaceship and, and the uh, the Mars uh, lunar lander, the thing that the balloon came up and tumbled, like I worked with Mike O'Neill who designed the parachute system or the bubble system on that. Uh. So it was just, you know, it's this whole class of people coming in and just problem solving stuff. So, so. the problem solving is the one of the things that you enjoyed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's to me, to me it's about, it's the technical challenge, it's making something pretty, but it, the most is about, you know, the team you're in the trenches with. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, for me it's always been wanting to be part of a team that was creating something amazing. Yeah. So, and that's what kind of has drew me to make make and that's what kept me there for so long. How long, how long, what did, what did, what did we decide on, how many years? You I think it was eight and a half-ish years. Feels like forever. Yeah. <laughs> Especially working with you. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but love. Yeah. <laughs> so what about you, Mike? Uh, man, uh, when, when I was four, my dad showed me Empire Strikes Back, and as soon as I saw that, like the AT-ATs, I was just like, okay, I want to do that, you know? And, uh, you know, George Lucas, I want to do what he does. I want to make movies. I want to write and direct. Like, that was my dream just all throughout my childhood. Right. And... Uh, the entire thing was I read George Lucas's biography when I was a kid, and he went to USC. So I was like, okay, that's that's my path. I'm going to USC film school like George Lucas did. Uh. And uh, yeah, but I graduated from high school. Um, I went to community college, and just to make that a reality, to get into USC film school, and to finally come out here and write and direct. And uh, you know, uh, I. One of the, the, the applications, the way I got into 3D was uh, the application for USC was you had to make a short film, and I procrastinated to the last second. I had, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we did, until like, I, I think it was like February 1st was the deadline, and I didn't get started until January 2nd or 3rd. I was like, oh crap, I didn't do this thing. Uh, yeah. And I had an idea for an animated short, uh, and I was like, if I do an animation move, an animated movie, I am gonna stand out. So I had no idea what was involved. I never had any 3D experience. I never opened up Maya, and I taught myself. I made an animated, a five-minute animated short in the span of a month, and it got me into USC. Nice. Yeah, it's nice. not good. It's it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's pretty terrible. Uh, I was showing everyone at the time, look what I made, and then like a year later, I looked back on it, and I was like. like yeah, yeah nice. just like oh, I show that it's. it's you're gonna, I want you gotta bring that into the office. I gotta. <laughs> oh man, I regret <laughs> that. Never happened. Never happened. Um, yeah, so I went to USC Film School, uh, and it was live action production. And the one thing about the live action production program was is that they ran it like when you make a short there, you have to make it like you would a Hollywood movie. You have to get permits, you have to location scout. If you have a gun on set, you have to hire an off-duty police officer. Or if you have a child under 18, you have to have a studio teacher. So it was, I, I really loved getting that education, but it was also creatively like just very frustrating because yeah. I wanted to do big explosions and have guns on set, yeah. you know, and all these crazy stuff. And so that always just like drew me back to animation. I was just like, I can do anything. Um, and then, so I graduated from USC, and I could not, for the life of me, get a job in the film industry, you know, because yeah. all my time was making these live action films. Uh, so the, I, went, I had to move back home to Vegas, and um, the one job opportunity that I had was to work at Pixar, which was one of my dreams, too. It's like, you know, it's either become George Lucas or work at Pixar, as, you know, my plan B. And <laughs> yeah. that's a nice plan B. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty good one, right? It was pretty cozy. So um, I, I had like three or four interviews at Pixar. I made it to the final round. It was just to be a production assistant. I was like getting to the ground level. I taught myself animation. Uh, you know, give me a year. I'll be, I'll be writing and directing my own shorts there. You know, yeah. they, you pitch stuff there. 
and I made it to the last round of the interview. I drove out there for each interview because I wanted to be on the campus, and it was amazing. And then um, I had my final interview on a Wednesday. They told me they were going to make a decision Friday. They called me the next day, uh, Thursday night, and I was like, dude, like I killed it so badly that they <laughs> are giving me the job early. And it turns out that they canceled the position. It was for, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is around the time when the good dinosaur, when they were making the good uh, dinosaur. Yeah. And yeah, so they had production problems on it. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was rough. Yeah. They, they canceled the, they pushed the release date back a year and they pushed all their movies back. And so they didn't need me anymore, so they canceled it. Aww. So yeah, that was so devastating. So I was in Vegas for a year working valet, parking cars. And I, on every weekend, every day, I'd go home and apply for any job I could to get out here. and. Um, I had a friend from USC who was interning at A5 Rock, Paper, Scissors, and they were looking for somebody, I think, in client services. Mm. And so I came out here and I interviewed on one of my days off, and Annie saw, I made sure to put on my resume that I knew Maya, mm -hmm. and you know, I kind of knew Nuke, so I said I knew Nuke, and mm -hmm. I knew all these things, and Annie saw that, and she's like, okay, well, client services, eh. I don't know, I guess my people skills were that good, <laughs> but she was like, we have something in the back in the vault. So I did uh, shipping and receiving and working with the assistant editors for, uh, yeah, and I, I, that's how I started. And um, when I got out here and I was working the vault, I just wanted to get out of the vault. <laughs> I just wanted to do something creative. So I, uh, I remember I sent you my, a demo reel, like I think my second week at A52 or you know, Rock, Paper, Scissors, and I was like, maybe you'll see it and you'll like put me into the three department right away. And you, I got no response to the email. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. My but, bad. Yeah, it's, it's okay. I actually, it was the same thing with my animated short that I made. I, I looked at the, what I sent you later on. And I was just like, oh my God. It was, it was, it was pretty, <laughs> like, if you're, if you're here at Noman, you, your demo reel's a thousand times better than what I sent Kirk. But um, I kept bugging you and I you, t you sent me to Joe Kiecki who was in the, the camera tracking department. Yeah. So I started bugging him and on my free time in the vault, I would go over to the CG department and track shots for jobs. Yeah. And I never did camera tracking, but it was something kind of more creative than what I was doing in the vault. You know, it, it you was learned, more creative. You learned pretty something. fast though, like you were yeah. out of there. Yeah. Not, not soon after. No, yeah, I think it was in the vault, like maybe nine, ten months, maybe. Yeah. Like, it was definitely a year. Within a year, I was in the. I was moved over to the CG department. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, Rebrock Chicken was the the first the first job I worked oh, on. Oh yeah, chicken. Yeah. That was in the demo reel, actually. Yeah, I, yeah. I saw that. Like yeah, I think I, I had a little twitch when. Yeah, that was traumatic. <laughs> that, that was huh? that was a tough job. Yeah. Yeah, I had a match move one of the the chicken cages like the. The, there's a cage that hits the ground that the oh chicken's yeah. in it, so I had to like deform. That took me like two weeks to do <laughs> to, to hand track that chicken cage. Well, but now, so, but, but now, but you're full circle back to SD wanting to blow stuff up. Yeah. Now you're doing VFX, blowing stuff up. Now I'm doing VFX, blowing stuff up, making um, blood effects, and yeah, doing cool stuff. I, the last thing I did was Snapchat, was making falling rainbow poop emojis <laughs> with dancing monkeys. <laughs> you know, of course, <laughs> this goes together. So, well, uh, yeah, crazy stuff. Never thought you'd be doing falling poop emojis, huh? No, no, I mean, no, I never, never did. I thought I'd be writing, directing like George Lucas. That's, that's still a work in progress, but, you know, I'll, I'll take, I'll take baby falling, steps, baby, baby steps. steps. I'll yeah. take falling poop emojis, you know? That's, <laughs> it's well, it's, it's, it's funny to hear, like, I don't have a, I applied and I got to the last round and I didn't get accepted story, <laughs> but um, I actually, started in psychology. Like, I went to SC for psychology. I think you guys know this. And um, I, grad I, I graduated from UCLA uh, with a psychology degree. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see myself going to grad school for it. Uh, and my best friend said, hey, you know, I'm going to go check out this school in the Bay for 3D. You want to come? So I went and checked it out. It was a different school. It doesn't matter. Um, and I looked around and I'm like, these guys, it doesn't seem like their stuff's current, right? They look kind of old and so I said, you should check out L.A. because we were in L.A. It's like, there's a ton of schools out here. So I started doing research for him on schools in L.A. that he could go to for 3D. And uh, I, I mentioned Noman, and I said, you should go check him out. He's like, nah, I changed my mind. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm like, okay. So then I came out here, and I checked out the campus. And I was like, this is kind of cool. So I took a class, 
and I think it, I think it was with Alex actually, um, and I liked it. I had a lot of fun with it. I was here in the labs till whenever they close, and I would come at 10 and stay until class and do the whole thing. Like you, you guys who are students know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and so I enrolled in their certificate program, um, and this was way back in 2001, I think. Um, and I finished their certificate program. And the first job I, the first job I got out of the gate was um, for a design house, uh, a place called Motion Theory. They're, they're kind of rolled into a larger company now, but um, that was the best thing that could have happened to me. Like when I was here at Nomen, I was like, exactly like these guys. I want to work at Pixar. I'm going to be a character <laughs> animator, right? Like I did all these animations for my animation class, and it was like the tricycle Reg Dream, right? I was doing spoofs on that and, you know, all of that. And as I started taking more and more classes, I was like, well, animation's cool, but, but lighting's cool. Like, I like lighting, lighting's cool. Texturing's awesome, you know? Like, modeling seems fun. Dynamics, dynamics is awesome, that's fun, right? And I realized, like, I couldn't just pick one thing to focus on. Like, I, I, I liked it all, the whole process of it, right? It wasn't just about one piece, it was about the whole project, like putting all those pieces together. And, and that's what I liked about it. So I think my first job out of the gate was at a design house and we got to do all of that. We got to do all of the different pieces of everything. It wasn't segmented out into a bunch of different departments and we didn't have a ton of people. It was a core group of people and we just went at it, you know? Um, and to me, that was always appealing because I felt like I was a bigger creative voice in the process. And that's kind of how I ended up at Make Make is it's the same kind of thing where, you know, I started out just as a, a CG soup um, and I souped a bunch of jobs, commercials, um, you know, a bunch of different random things there. And I got to soup Game of Thrones season one, the main title for that. Um, and that was kind of life-changing because we were small enough where they would pull me into all of the creative meetings. So I got to see the process unfold. That first season took two years, right, to actually come to fruition because the needs for what we were trying to do changed all the time. So I actually got a chance to listen to Angus Wall and Rob Fang um, talk about what we needed to achieve creatively and visually. And it kind of just sucked me in. And, and I was like, this is what I've been looking for. Like, this is the kind of thing, right, where I feel like I can contribute, right? I'm not just doing a piece or I'm not just doing a portion. I'm, I'm, I'm affecting the whole thing, you know? Um, so then, you know, from that, I, I kind of realized, for me, the thing that drives me and the projects that I enjoy most are the projects where I feel like I've affected the outcome in a, in a substantial way, you know? And, and I can actually say, yes, I worked on that. And, and you know, I can, I can tell people what my contributions to that project were. So, you know, for me, from psychology to Nomen to these design houses and then through all of the different freelance jobs that I've had, I've always searched for those kind of things. Um, and it wasn't until I started putting this together and we were talking about it where the question of why, like why did I choose to work at the places I did? Why did I come to Nomen? Like why did I make the decisions I did? What am I looking for, you know? Um, those are the kind of things that I think everybody kind of internalizes on their own time and they're trying to figure it out. Like, what is it that drives me? What is it that I'm looking for? Why am I making these choices, you know? Um, why am I working here over, uh, over this place, you know? Why am I not working at this other place? You know, what is it, why am I going into games? Like, I'm sure a lot of you, uh, how many people here are trying to get into games right now? A good chunk. Like, we didn't even have a gaming track <coughs> when I was here, so. Uh, and then how many people are in um, film? Want to go to film or working in film? Yeah, so it's like half-half. So the question I have for you guys is why? What is it about those things? Why do you why do you want to work in games? Why do you want to work in film? Because I think if you really think about it, there's a lot of things you're going to realize about the things that you're looking for, right? And a place like our shop, 
we're not always front of mind, right? Like we're talking about mm -hmm. Pixar, ILM, like big studios, you know, huge movies, right? Work on all this Marvel stuff, right? Um, but just remember there's other options out there for your creative exploration and growth um, that if you really ask yourself why and what you're looking for, you might find there's other opportunities out there that you'll enjoy. Um, and you can have a big impact at a smaller place as well, you know, versus being in line behind a lot of other talented people that are trying to do the same thing at a, at a larger company. You know, it's just about, about numbers. So I mean, Mike B, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, he started you know, in a vault. Yeah, he started in a vault. Now he's working VFX. He, he worked on House of the Dragon, right? So, you know, I think it's, it's all about the why. I mean, I don't know what you think, Mike. But. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I remember like when I first graduated, like I wanted, like I said, I wanted to be like George Lucas, do Star Wars, I wanted to do the big, the big things. And I, you know, I think recently actually, I was like kind of thinking about it. Like that was, that, that always like made me, that like, gave me kind of like a spark, like thinking about that dream of like finally like having a movie with my name on it, you know, something I made in the theaters and people watching something I made, like, that gave me that spark. And I was like, I think I, I always thought I, I had to like have that. Like I had to make a hundred million dollar movie in the theaters in order to be successful, in order to feel that spark, right? And now I think it's kind of been inverted. Like I realize like being in effects and working with you guys that, you know, like seeing the stuff that, like even just seeing that reel that, that mm -hmm. you, you made earlier, like, I, that was the first time I, I didn't see this, and it's just, like, this gives me that, that spark, it kind of, like, gives me that life, it's just, like, I want to do this, like, I want to, you know, I want to make stuff like this, I want to have a creative voice, and, and, you know, just being at, like, this company, and growing, and learning new parts of the industry, learning new things, learning new skills, and growing, and being able to, it's, if I feel like I'm able to have that voice, develop that voice in order to like cr express myself, right? Mm. And like that's that's what kind of like when you say why, like that that's what kind of like what drives me is just this like constant growth and expansion. And like the stuff that we work on, it's a lot of projects. It's you know like the deadlines are like two weeks, maybe a month. I think House of the Dragon was a couple months long, which was a long project for us. Yeah. And the thing is, is like for me, it's just like. You, I get so much practice, just, you know, I, I, I exp I'm always doing something new. I'm always learning something and growing. And like, I started off as a match mover and I'm a damn good match mover just because I track yeah, you so are. many shots. Yeah, yeah. You, are. yeah. I, I, you could probably throw a GoPro out in an airplane and I can track that shot and get something to stick in there, you know? It's, okay, it's, <laughs> you all heard that, right? Yeah. So, oh, okay. so when we do get that shot and he's complaining about it. Just, yeah. email, <laughs> just email it to him and he'll yeah, take care yeah. of it. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll, uh, I'll outsource that or try to chat GPT <laughs> or something, I think, yeah. But oh, also I, what I thing. find about interesting just looking at, at the reel as well is it's, it's it feels multimedia, it's, it's a collage, it feels like cut paper, it feels like, you know, sticks, and, you know, there's, there's a huge range of visual expression there that, yeah. that we had a chance to impact on, but then also, for me, it's different problems to solve, because every time it's just like, you know, they'll come to be like, hey, we got this and this and this, and I'm like, can you do it? I'm like, yes! Yeah. And they're like, I have no idea how we're gonna do that. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's constant, you know, creative problem solving. It's not just one plus two equals three. You know, it's, 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 it, there, it's a collaborative process because there's a creative vision and then there's the like, the rubber meets the road on like how mm -hmm. you actually figure out how to do it and, and, a, and a team effort, right? Yeah. You know, I think visual effects is very much a team sport and I think the company that we work for and, and the, the department that, that you've grown that I've kind of taken over is very much that kind of, you know, you go, we go, like, you know, a-holes in the building because it's it's about the work. It's not about any, any one ego. And, like and that's that. refreshing. I think the other thing, too, to, to stress is that, you know, we're playing some stuff in the background here of some of the projects that we've worked on, but most of the projects that we work on generally have, I mean, on average, it's maybe six people right, six to 10. Um, anything more than that is, yeah. it's a little bit of a larger job or it has a lot of um, kind of heavy lifting that needs to happen. 
But everybody who works on a project is essential to making sure that project delivers. Yeah, they're pulling a lot of weight. Yeah, and, and you know, like Mike can attest to this, right? Like he's the front end, when he's tracking, he's the front end of everything, right? So plates come in and, you know, it's him and, and Joe Kiecki, who's another guy that's been working with us forever. But, you know, they, they basically just plow through it all. And if we didn't have them, like they're, they're just as important to the process as as every other step along the way. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a huge company to like make everything happen and you know, kind of distribute it out into small bite-sized chunks. Everybody has to grab a piece and just go. Um, so for him, working on House of the Dragon, um, I think we only, ha we only had you and one other dynamics person. Yeah. Right? Uh, it, was it was June and June, June. And then, yeah, Pete was on it for a little bit too. Oh like, yeah, Pete. Yeah. So, you know, we had all these fluid sims and stuff. Um, and we probably did a total of five minutes of content, um, and every shot had fluid sims in it. And it was basically him and uh, our, our VFX artist, June, and, and then another person half the time. So it kind of goes to show you, like, it, everybody has to take ownership of the piece that they're working on and really inject themselves into it. Um, and in a lot of this stuff too, you know, like this one here, this is from, um, what is this? There's a bunch of it. What's that? For All Mankind. Is yeah, For All Mankind. Yeah. So there was a ton of stuff here. I think it was 10 minutes of total content. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but I mean, 10 it's, minutes it's a lot. A, 10 minutes <laughs> is a lot, full CG, right? Um, and the crew wasn't that big. It was, it was pretty small and it was just rolling deliveries and all this stuff, but everybody kind of contributed. So, you know, if you watch that breakdown back, it's, it's everything from concept to boards to um, style frames to previous to, you know, all that stuff. We're, we're handling all of that stuff in, in the whole process and talking to showrunners and making sure that, you know, they're cool with everything and they like it where it's going and then making sure a company like Apple their creative directors um, like where it's headed and, and that sort of thing, but everybody has a, a really big role in each of these. Um, what else we got here? So I think we'll probably move on to, let's move on to our first, we're, we're gonna cover th three spots today. Um, so we'll move on to the first spot. And Wilkoff, uh, why don't you kind of talk us through this IKEA Little Worlds job? Kind of stand up so I can yeah. see what this is. So this was a job we did a, a number of years ago, and but it's still a really amazing spot. So I think we're gonna we're gonna show the behind the scenes. And the interesting thing about this is it's another one of these commercials where you get these boards and you have six or seven weeks to do it, and you're like. How are we going to do this? It's not all CG. There's live action. How are we going to shoot it? So the thing that happens when when you're working in the kind of work for hire and you're working with a director, they have a specific vision. And the directors will bring mood boards and this and, and concept sketches and you know enough detail to kind of get you started. And then that leaves us to fill in the gap. So there's a lot of there's a lot of technical creativity and there's just a lot of interpreting a, a little sketch into something real. And then, you know, here we're seeing a number of different things happen of, of multiple plates, multiple coordinations between departments. We had to coordinate with first unit production, be like, okay, you need to build these domes. They need to be about this big because that's how big we want our planets to be. And then they're like, well, we can't do it like this, but we can do it like that. And we're like, okay, that's gonna work. And we gotta figure out how they're gonna shoot it to make it look like it's rotating so that w when we put it in, it feels like it's rotating on its own. And it just, so there's, there's a lot of collaboration. And like going back and looking at all these kind of bits, it's pretty cool to see all these things come together. Bleh, come, come together. Um, this was kind of my favorite thing is because the bird was just sitting there and we animated it and kind of did a really nice seamless transition to the bird kind of flying in there. But um, this job was very kind of rewarding because a lot of the time it, it, came, it came together a lot at the end, but it's like, oh my God, are we, how are we gonna do this? We're we gonna get this done, we're we gonna do this, we're we gonna do that. And it's just like, take a breath, take a step, you know? 
you, you try and eat a cake all at once, you're not going to eat it. So you just take little bites at it and you kind of knock it, knock it down. Uh, you want to go to the to the next one. So these are some of the things that I was talking about. So this was some production artwork that was provided by the director and his concept team. So we're given some black and white stills. We're given some, you know, mood boards. I'm sure everybody's familiar with kind of doing some internet research and figuring out what the tone of your piece is. Oh, I like this guy. I don't like that guy. This is good. That's not good. So these are the kind of things that we'll, we'll get at the beginning of a project. And this is also way after we've kind of read a treatment which has no detail and we say, okay, we can do this for this, this amount of money. And then we really see what it's going to look like after we've committed. <laughs> um, you want to go to the next one? Sure. And again, this is just showing more of kind of Originally, some of the stuff that I wanted to do is pre-production. And it really kind of sets the tone. So having a good foundation for when you're doing your own projects is doing the research, getting looks down, figuring out what you like and what is already done that's similar to it, and just kind of put together on a big, a big board. Um, next one. And what I like about this is this is in a snapshot is kind of showing everything in the production. It's showing, okay, here's the director's boards. This is, this is what he wants to convey. This is what we shot, and this is kind of how it went in. Here's the little sketch that we got that we, got that we had to kind of translate into the real world. Down here was from a, the treatment of saying, okay, these are the colors that the director wanted. So, you know, we spent a lot of time creating skies, making, making skies, doing clouds to kind of hit that right mood. Um, next one. This obviously is probably one of the biggest shots in it. So if you go through, you look at all the different plates. There's one, two, three, four, five. Six. There's like 10 different plates. So then you're tracking this. Now it's tracking, but it's doing its own motion. But then we need to put in another move that's a CG camera that's then taking those plates and integrating. So we had to figure out how to animate it. And then we're taking all of these things as far as the little, these are basically on napkin sketches. So if you look at the real sketches, they're like yellow and you know, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's literally, okay, this is what I want it to feel like. And then we need to kind of take that, that, uh, that translation. So there's, it's like creativity, creativity within boundaries, right? So you, you, you take, you, you can't always be the director. You can't always, you know, drive your vision. You know, in, uh, in advertising, the client is king and they, you want to enact what their vision is. So if the client is like, I want the sky to be orange or the sun is going to be green, then like, I'm going to make this the best damn green sun that ever existed. And so finding that creativity creativity within the confines of a, you know, of a for hire thing is, is one of the challenges that I think is, is really fun, especially when you get that team sport and you get the team involved in solving these problems together. This is one of my favorite shots of the spot as far as they initially shot a, um, a miniature and it was working, but it wasn't working perfect. And we're like, all right, we're just going to do it. And again, mood boards, here's what the original vision of the director is. So you can see how it starts as a, a germination of an idea. Here's some reference of what they want it to look like. Here's some things that they want to convey. And then, you know, the sum of the parts equals, you know, a really beautiful frame that the lighting artist and the layout artist, who is Dustin Mellum, did an amazing job of getting to that because you can kind of see all those parts in the reference and in the storyboard, but you don't see that final frame there. And that was, you know, the skill and the creativity of, of the lighting artist that kind of got us to there, which was, which is, which is pretty great. So in this project, for instance, you didn't have a ton of um, light setups that were pre-baked or like exact reference or anything like that. It mm -hmm. was very much find it as you go. Yeah, pretty much like what you're seeing is kind of what we, what we did, we did some previs to kind of get some rough blocking, and mm -hmm. so they had an idea on set for timing and pace and the story that oh, there were a story they wanted to tell. But you know, as far as conveying the depth 
and, you know, the mood and the lighting, you know, golden sun, you know, moody lens flares, but not, not moody where it's scary, but moody where it's awe-inspiring. You know, there's, there's, there's nuance to everything. So finding, finding those challenges in the job and, and pulling off a really beautiful frame and just, for me, just being there and being able to support and help Dustin do that was, is, is amazing. And then again, this is the last shot, which is probably one of the most subtle shots besides obviously the background is that the transition that we did from, from the bird. This particular director who's, who's amazing and we've done a bunch of work for him, loves putting animals in his spots and, and it's always fun to see how he, he adds a little. He likes birds. He likes birds. Yeah. Yeah. Adds, adds a little bird into that. So if you go back and look at a uh, stuffed monster with on the on their website of the reel, it's the same director, and there's a little bird kind of landing on his his shoulder. I mean, it's kind of an interesting point too. Like as you work in in the industry for a while, you start building relationships with different people and, and directors, and and then you know I think it is about this co creative collaboration. Yeah. Like he's worked with us enough to know. Like, I know you guys are gonna make it look good, but yeah. let's figure out what it could be, right? Like, take, take what you think it is and then go up here, right? Like, add 25% yeah. to what you think it could be. And yeah. I think there's a lot of trust. In, in and when you get in those relationships, there's, there's a lot of collaborative, collaboration back and forth. Yeah. You're like, hey, try this. And we're like, hey, we tried it and it didn't really look good, but we kind of tried this and we're like, oh, that's great. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it, everything, you know, it's, it's managed chaos, right? You yeah. know, and, you know, I think about it as like the journey where I started, where I wanted to be in, you know, pre-production and, and art direction, but I just kind of followed the river and, and the flow of where it went. I was going the same direction. I'm still being, I'm still in entertainment, yeah. but I'm somewhere else. And that's kind of like each little story of, of a commercial is kind of telling that same thing, is that you start with one thing and then you kind of, you point it in that direction and you just keep it going that direction if it's not exactly what you wanted, uh -huh. but it's still, it could still be great. Yeah. So how was it, so Mike is in a unique position in that he actually worked on the pro all the projects that we're gonna be talking about today, but in different capacities. So in this one, you had to deal with the 50 million different camera moves and yeah. all the set stuff, plus all the stuff on top and all that stuff. How was he on the job? Was he okay? Was he, was he? Him? Yeah, uh, you know. you're the slave driver. <laughs> Me, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I'm, 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 he's, I'm with him in the, the, we're working on a project right now at work, so I'm in the room with him, so I have to be, I have to be nice right now, <laughs> you know, if we were still working remote, you know. Now, Wolkoff's amazing, like, you know, everyone we work with on the team is, is just a joy to work with, um, especially on this one, like, you know, with like all the million different camera tracks, like there, especially w some of the bird shots, especially I remember is like there was like a rack, a lot of it's out of focus and it's just like a nightmare to track because there's literally nothing to grab. There's nothing to grab and they need a CG bird to stick perfectly in the plate. So, you know, Wilkoff and Kirk, like you guys are awesome to work with because I can always go to them and be like, hey, like, this is not trackable. This is just not doable. What can we do to, to get around? Can we cheat this one a little bit? And then, well, and that, that's where like, kind of like the, the flow of the project kind of takes over, right? Yeah. And everything kind of gets adjusted along the mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, just, you just adjust and... All right, let's show the full spot. You want to see Yeah, yeah, spot? let's show the whole spot. Okay. In my book of dreams, that's where I draw all of my rainbows and horses that I ride up to the clouds and all my wishes. If I wish for you and me on the first star I see, then you will be my book of dreams. If I wish for you and me on the first star. Beautiful possibilities. That bird shot is still my favorite. I think Brian Cox animated that bird. 
so just, you know, in a spot like this, if you think about it, there's fur, there's feathers, there's animation, there's tracking, there's lighting, there's dynamics, there's a all sorts of- A ton of furniture. We have this, we had a spreadsheet that was, <laughs> went on forever because it was an Ikea client. So we received a ton it had of be, data it, from Everything that. was Ikea furniture, right? Yeah. yeah. Some of the deep background stuff wasn't, but like a lot of the, the, the featured stuff was, was Ikea. Yeah. And it went through an approval process and yeah. some stuff stayed, some went, some came back. And uh, that, that, becomes, that becomes a management kind of well, issue. Well, what I was gonna talk about was, how many people were on that job? Um, there's probably three, and again, this goes back to, if you look at it on paper, maybe there was 15, right? But there's maybe only three to four or five at any at given any time. Given so, so animators come on yeah. and help and then do their thing. Or the modeler's obviously starting and kind of going, you know, building assets and texturing, and then the, the lighter's coming on after the animators, and, yeah. and some of the layout and track tracking happens, and then compositing. So I think we had three lighters on that, three asset guys, yeah. obviously, you know. Tracking. <laughs> Mike, yeah. Mike and Joe pulling their hair out, yeah. doing a bunch of tracks. So you know. it's interesting because there's so many dis disciplines represented in that one spot, but if you think about it, like, like Wilkoff picked up fur and feathers and all this stuff because of a need. So, you know, it's it's very much we do have people working in specific areas, but the modeler's texture, the lighter's texture, you know, he does dynamics if we need it, right? Like there's everybody just grabs a chunk and owns it, um, and that's kind of a good example of um, that team mentality where yeah. it's you just kind of do what you can to make sure that the visuals come out as best as they, they, they can, you know? Yeah, I call it like having a major and a minor, right? So there's one thing that you're really good at and you really enjoy, but then having one or two of these little minor minor well, skills. It's funny you say that because when I was coming in, when I was a student at Noman, Alex Alvarez had a saying. I don't know if he still says this. Tell me if he still says this, but he used to say, jack of all trades, master of one. Master of one. <laughs> Master of one. So his thing was, you're really good at one thing, but you can do everything, right? Does he still say that? No, maybe? I think it's a great saying. I think yeah. it, 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 it's, um, it's one of those things where I think most of the guys on our team kind of follow that philosophy where they're really, they have their primary skill set, but they're willing to jump in and, and contribute in all sorts of different areas. Um, so it makes it fun, right? So, you know, like, a little also, stressful yeah. sometimes, but it's <laughs> yeah. But it's a different. But yeah, like, it's a different. It's, it's a different it, kind it, of. Stress. It's a motivation. It kind of, you know, yeah, pushes yeah. you to kind of grow. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. things get boring. And you know, I think um, having that that core group working on these projects together is uh, it, it makes the time go by a lot faster. And you always know, like someone always has your back, right? If you're having, if you're underwater, or if you need some help with some shots, or you need somebody to help you light something. You know, somebody will come in and help you out with that and make sure. Yeah, no judgment, done. huh? No judgment. It's just like no, yeah. It's it's, it's all it's all yeah yeah. We're all together on it. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go through um, Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon. So um, we can talk about kind of some of the things that I enjoyed working on the project. Um, some of the stuff that I learned along the way. So for. Oh, So when we started, it, it kind of started as a really rough idea, um, and they wanted to do it as interstitials between um, parts of the episode. They wanted to actually stick it inside the episode. They wanted to kind of localize people that way. Um, but early on, you know, Dan and David, the showrunners, realized that that would just take people out of the show, and it would just kind of kill the flow. So then they tasked Angus Wall and uh, um, Rob Fang with creating something for the main title that can kind of help people understand where they are in the world, right? Um, so it quickly evolved. Um, and then we kind of went through and started pulling a ton of ref. Ref is everything for what we do because it inspires and it, it draw, you can draw inspiration from almost anything. It doesn't have to be related. Um, so this is just some of the ref that we pulled. Um, it just keeps going and going. Hundreds and hundreds of, of reference images. 
And we kind of just glean different ideas from each one of them. And then from that, right, this is where, for me, I, I found it really exciting was when we started concepting. Um, I got a chance to work with Rustam, who did all the concept art. Like, I've been working with him since season one. Uh, he did all the concept art for House of the Dragon. Like, we've, we've built this kind of relationship over the last 12, it's been 12 years now. Yikes. Um, so, you know, he kind of started building out these concept sketches. And this is where everything started coming together. And this is where I felt like I could actually have a voice in everything, where it's, um, you know, he and I sitting at a table and he's actually sketching on paper. Back then he was sketching on paper. And he was like, what about this? I'm like, eh, you know, like maybe we should try this. I think, you know, let's try this and this and then let's see what Angus thinks, see what Rob thinks and, you know, kind of start throwing things out there. And, and that's where I kind of got this idea in my head of like, this is the, this is the process that I enjoy. It's figuring this stuff out, right? I, I like figuring out, uh, uh, figuring out solutions to problems, creative problems. Um, so there's this kind of stuff. Um, then we started getting into some turntables and look dev and that sort of thing. So these are some of the locations that we did. Uh, and then we get into, so that was eight years of season one through seven. And I was acting as a, a CG lead up to season seven and then season seven, you know, I got a chance to do a little bit of art direction, which was awesome, right? So um, throughout this show, I kind of grew creatively and I, I got some opportunities to stretch my legs. And I, it's, I, it was an invaluable experience. It's life-changing for me. Um, so in season eight, we kind of started elevating things a little bit and adding some more animation and m finer detail and things like that. So me and Russ went through and started building out these very specific callouts and things like that, um, things like the throne room and each of the locations, you know, he's amazing. Um, so then he started pulling, you know, reference for materials and things like that. And, you know, you can see in here, like thinking about how things move. Uh, that was one of the hardest things for the show was figuring out how to model things to actually work. Um, you can't just pre-model it. It's modeling and animation have to happen together along with rigging. So. It made it, uh, the process a little bit slower, but uh, at the end of the day, it was, uh, it came out really well. So like the tree, right? Um, you know, from this, we had to figure out how to suck all the leaves back in and then how to rig it and make sure it looked correct. Um, some of the stuff for Winterfell. And then season eight. So for us, you know, this one was, oh, what happened? What? Sorry. Sorry. One sec. All right, who wants to hear a joke? Oh, no. <laughs> he's, he's Mr. Dad joke. Let's, let's not encourage him, okay? Um, in a moment, though. So, when you guys ever asked, answered which favorite movie you worked on? Each one of you had a, like, a oh, um, the, uh, the first film I worked on was X-Men. Okay. And, uh, really? I'll, I'll digress and tell a little story, as I, I, I never do that, though. Um, so, I was at Digital Domain, it was around 2000. Um, and I'm working on this film, I'm, I'm, I'm freelance, and I wound up kind of stepping up and leading the, uh, the environment team. And unfortunately, during the production, my dad, my dad got sick with cancer. And so the job wrapped out, and I went home to spend some time with him. And my producer, Amy Wixon, who I will be forever in debt, to this day, um, called Vox Studios and arranged the, I forget who the, the head of Vox Features was at the time, but had to approve it. But because my dad was in, you know, he was in bed and he couldn't really, really move. And uh, 
they flew an intern out to Pittsburgh with a videotape and walked up the door, handed it to us. Um, we watched the movie so my dad can see the credits. And then um, when we were done, we handed it back to him and he took off. So, um, and that was my first, my first feature. So my dad was able to actually see that, see that movie. So it was, it was a pretty, pretty special experience. So there is, there is a morality and good people in the movie industry. <laughs> how do I, f how do I follow that? I can't follow that. Yeah. Well, play Game of Thrones. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's a great, I didn't, I never heard that. Yeah. Oh. All right, let's try this again. Oh. <laughs> I swear. Okay, now I'll yeah. tell a joke. No, 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 I got it, I got it, I got it. it's working, it's working, it's working. <laughs> well, the audio's not working. You guys, all, yeah, you all seen this before, right? So, da, 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 da. <laughs> Um, so, you know, for me, the things that we really wanted to put in into seasons one through seven were those flippy tiles and going into stuff. And we never got that opportunity until season eight. So when we got that chance, we were like, oh yeah, let's do that. Like, you know, we've been sitting on all these ideas for basically eight years. Every season that we, we basically updated the map, we were like, ah, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this, you know? And then we're like, well, we only have two weeks to run up the, run through the updates and get all the new locations out. But in season eight, Dan and David said, just blow it out, go do your thing, because we're gonna, we're gonna end the show with a bang. And so everybody was like, yes, let's do this. So, you know, I think everybody who worked on the job, I tried to grab as many people from the original season, season one, as I could to finish off season eight. And ironically, I would say 90% of the people that worked on season one were still in our office working. So I basically just, poached them all from other jobs and stuck them on this one and everybody was, we just had such a good time doing this, this last one. And I think it shows, you know, like people really went above and beyond and spent extra time making sure that everything was perfect because they knew this was our last chance to kind of uh, wrap this whole show up. Um, so yeah. So yeah, for me creatively, I think it was great because we actually got to put in all the ideas that we've been kind of, that have been percolating for so long. And then now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about House of the Dragon. So um, this is uh, one of the hardest things I've ever had to work on. I'll say that straight away because it's a, it's a Game of Thrones asset, right? It, it's part of that universe. How do you follow up Game of Thrones? And I think the show had that same concern, right? How do you follow up a show that's so huge with something else that lives in that same universe? Like, how do you do that, uh, you know? Um, so for us, we kind of, we talked with the showrunners and their primary concern was showing lineage, showing how the families have grown and who's related to who, because there's so many characters in there and it takes like a whole episode just to kind of figure out who's related to who. Um, so we went in with this idea of a family tree. Um, the initial ideas, we, I built so many decks for this thing covering different directions, uh, somewhere closer to the original Game of Thrones title that was more like cogs and clockwork and, and kind of mechanical bits. And then I went completely the other direction and tried something that was really organic and kind of stylized and different. Um, and I think we always ended up in this kind of middle portion where there's hints of what the original was, but not necessarily taking it so far where it felt unrelated. And that's the hardest line to draw, right? So, um, you know, some of this stuff here you'll see, these are actually concept sketches for some earlier ideas that we had that actually didn't make it. Um, so in here, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have seen the, the opening for House of the Dragon, but it's basically this river of blood flows through the, the, the kingdom of Valeria. Right? So it's a giant city and the blood flows through this and each level of the city represents another generation. Um, but the, the initial idea we had was in a lot of the artwork that we saw and a lot of the, the sh episodes that we had seen early, there was a lot of um, sculptural kind of 
influences in a lot of these locations. So, you know, the giant map table feels like a sculpture. The, you know, um, all the stuff like uh, Corliss's castle, there's all these sculptures in his, in his throne room. They're, they're all over the place, they're huge. So we were throwing around this idea of, well, what if they built this family tree out of stone? And what would that look like if it lived in the heart of Dragonstone? So, you know, these are kind of some initial sketches that we had where we were playing with these ideas um, and trying to come up with a language where we could follow this, this blood flow through these different levels, um, different forms, different shapes. And we kind of netted out, this is kind of the thing that we all were, were kind of drawn to, this hanging kind of spiraling form. Um, you know, and, and there was, there's, these are the things I nerd out on, like the logic of it, right? Like, there's, there has to be a reason for it, right? It can't just be there, especially on a show like House of the Dragon where everything's very deliberate. Um, so when we started breaking it down, it's like, well, this, this section is gonna be green and this section is gonna be black. And, you know, it kind of mm, t spoke to the different family kind of dynamics and things like that and where people were situated and how their icons were set up. Um, a lot of this stuff, even though this idea didn't, in the end, didn't get made, a lot of the concepts put into this idea transferred over to the stuff that you see in the final show. So, you know, where we, we might, we might have spent a lot of time figuring out an idea that didn't actually get made, the ideas that went into that and the concepts that went into that actually translated over, so we ended up using them quite a bit. And that one actually made it into the, the actual final piece. So let's hope, hopefully this one plays. But you'll notice, right, um, the, the high tower side's green, right? The, the Valeron side is, is very, um, like, cool. There's, like, teal tones in there. It's, like, it kind of hints just visually to kind of localize you, right? So each part of the family had their own section. Um, and then when it comes to things like uh, children and that sort of thing, like where those, those lines meet and the icons that they have, you'll see like there's a lot of time and energy spent into defining what those little icons were, right, the, the sigils. Um, the outside of each sigil had a specific design for each house. And then when they mixed, we would combine those two styles together in a way where um, you knew that this was a child of say, a Targaryen and a Valeron, right? So all that stuff, a ton of thought and energy went into kind of figuring out what that stuff was. Um, and it's funny because we spent all this time thinking of these things and um, it goes by so fast, right? But we know it's there. And for people who actually go through frame by frame, um, those are the people that I appreciate because they can Nobody see. Nobody really does that though, right? No, yeah, well, you know. I, I know a lot of people that just go <laughs> they have to hit it like five times because the title's so long. But um, you know, for people who actually go in and look at that stuff, I, I really that's kind of why I'm doing it is for those diehard fans that they want to get something out of it. They're looking for it, right? And I want to make sure that they're the ones that can walk away from the title and say, that was cool. Like I saw this and I saw this. And, and you know, that, like the, there's that one thing that nobody's found yet. I haven't seen it online. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the thing, the thing, the thing, and the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's just play this real quick. Hopefully this, oh, that worked.
one thing, uh, the thing I really like, and I got this from Game of Thrones, is the idea of um, the changing of the main title, right? To, to show the, the changing of the narrative of the, the plot of the, the show. Um, this one, we had initially talked about just doing one version. And I think everybody on the team was like, no, we can't do that. We can't just do one. Like, you're, you're setting expectations with Game of Thrones. You can't just come out with one. So then it went to three. And then we're like, okay, three. We could probably do three. Uh, and then at the end of it, I think we ended up doing five. Because I, I think everybody on the team was like, it, you, you gotta have, like, you need a version for this show because this episode does this and this and this. So you gotta show that in the next episode. Um, so for me, that's part of the fun too, is uh, evolving this thing over time just to kind of help the narrative and kind of educate people on what they missed maybe in the previous episode. Um, and a lot of that I got from Game of Thrones and I know Angus feels the same way, is like if, if we can add narrative to a show just by watching the main title and you can get everybody up to speed, it's, it's kind of a, a unique thing. It's a unique opportunity that you have to take. So, um, so yeah. That was um, one of the most uh, challenging jobs I've had, but for, for me it was super rewarding and, and I, I'm kind of looking forward to season two. So we'll see what happens. Um, so I think in conclusion, I think we're gonna talk a little bit real briefly um, about following your why. Like, why do you guys wanna go into film? Why do, why do, you know, why do I wanna go to Nomad? Why do I wanna do 3D? Like, why do I want to work at a design house? Like asking these questions of yourself um, and really being honest about what drives you creatively and kind of um, just personally, I think is, is super important. And I think these guys spoke to that a little bit about, you know, I know Wilkoff, you and I were talking about how um, being through kind of all the different parts of the industry, mm -hmm. you ended up at Make Make. Um, Maybe just real briefly, if you can tell us what kind of keeps keep keeps drawing you over and and why you've been I at mean, Make Make for so long. It, it's constant challenge for me, but it's it's also learning. You know, it's it, it's almost it's a metaphor for life. It's like enduring. You know, we're creating something, but then you know, it's it's about the journey of of the creation and of the process. You know, yeah. and just really kind of being a part of it and you know I know the industries have changed because we're you know a little bit more remote now and you know there's some hybrid solutions but you know you want to the people you're you're working with you spend a lot of time with you know mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes maybe more than your your family <laughs> right most and, of the time yeah. and it you know it's about you know liking who you work with it's about you know, being, you know, valued and, and being part of a team and, you know, just just create creating and being like, I, I made this, you know, yeah. and I kind of want to share it with, with everybody. And, mm. you know, for the, for the longest time, because I didn't want to be in front of the camera, being behind it was the, the next best thing, mm. you know. You know, I like going to the mall and, grocery shopping without being mobbed by people. <laughs> I don't think you have anything to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> what about you, Mike? Uh, I mean, a little bit, you guys touched upon it all. Um, for me, I think it's it's been just, you know, every job's a new challenge. It's something I've never done before. It's always stretching me creatively. Um, it's a little bit stressful, but at times, you know, because we have a tight turnaround, tight deadline, but that, uh, you know, it's, that's also when I'm like, I feel like I'm on my most creative, you know, figuring out solutions and trying to get this effect done mm. and trying to fi find out how to do it. And I, I really, I've learned so much throughout 
I've been, I've been at Make Make since May 2014. That's when I started in the vault. Mm -hmm. And I've, every day I'm learning something new. I'm growing as an artist. I can do new projects. I, I can stretch out into different areas. I can, if I want to try lighting or animation, I'm pretty sure like you guys will let me if I, you know, if mm -hmm. I bug you enough, you know? Yeah, for just, <laughs> just, just send me your, your reel. Send me your reel. I'll send you, I'll send you. You <laughs> got he'll, it. He'll, he'll, <laughs> get right, he'll get right back to you. Yeah, yeah. he'll get right back to me, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's, and then, you know, it's just like the stuff that we work on, it's so, it's inspiring. Like, you know, like I see stuff that you, you guys do, like we're all, we're all, we're all on different spots sometimes and I'll see something that Kirk does and it, it's just like, it, something about it lights me up and it makes me like, oh, like I want to learn that. I want to know how to do that, you know, or, you know, something that Wolkoff's done, you know, it's just like, oh my God, like, like the Ikea thing, it's so cool. Like. That, that makes me want to just like dive in and learn other areas and really expand out. And you know, every day there's something inspiring. Like I'm always like, it's, I, I feel I feel like alive, you know? It's, uh, I, mean, I don't know, maybe a little cliche, but like I feel that spark, <laughs> that, that thing that like, I remember like when watching Empire Strikes Back and feeling that, that like, whoa, you know, that wave. Like I, I feel that every day, like, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's like cool. you're, you're, yeah. you're wanting to create like that moment of awe, that moment of wonder for somebody. Yeah. You know, like somewhere somebody's going to see this for the first time and they're going to be like, whoa, that's cool. Yeah. You know, that's that's really kind of what it's what it's for. And, you know, you do your best to put it out there and, and you know, you hope that it happens. Yeah, yeah I think, um, you know, it, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. But just in conclusion, I think the... The thing, uh, going back to the very beginning, um, there's there's a lot of creative opportunities for everybody, right? Um, and they're not always in the areas where you would think they might be. Um, so, you know, for all of us, we all kind of made our way to this point in different kind of from different parts of the country and different fields, and but we all found our way to to make make in this case, um, and and this is the place where we feel comfortable and that we feel like we have some creative voice and we can stretch and grow and that sort of thing. But just realize, you know, for the students that are here and, and people who are looking for work, um, there's a lot of really great and interesting creative opportunities in areas of this, this humongous industry that you might not know about. So um, it's always good to kind of keep an eye out and ask around and, um, and it's follow your why. To be honest, it's, it's a good boot camp. You know, like we've had some amazing artists that we've worked with and they've, they've had the bug. They're like, hey, I want to work in features. And, you know, the, the turnaround it. and the speed and all that kind of stuff, like, yeah. can, can really prepare you for a different pace and level. And then when you get there, you could be like, well, I kind of liked where I was before, <laughs> you know, maybe, or this is, or you're ready for it, you know? So there's, there's, you know, Life is about constant change, you know, and it's about um, looking in places where you might not have thought. Yep. So that's that's all we got for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for. Uh, thanks for for being here. Thank you to everybody who's watching. Um, we really enjoyed coming out here, and I, I think for us it was fun. So. Uh, Hopefully you guys got something out of it and it was enjoyable, it wasn't too dry. So uh, yeah, have a good night. Are we doing, are we doing a Q &A? Oh yeah, is there, there's a Q&A, right? <laughs> Sorry, I, I forgot about that. You're like, that. oh, I see you, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> check, 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 hey, here we are. Psych, y'all, there's a q and A. I bet none of y'all have any questions, but if you do have a question, I'm raise your hand. Stand I'll bring you this amazing Q, oh, here we go. I see the <laughs> hands, y'all. Um, no, I'm not old or anything. <laughs> That's fine. I don't have a spine anymore. It's all twisted up. You're just going to point the cube at your face and ask the question. It's very uh, economical. Thank you. Oh, it's a cube. That's cool. <laughs> That's Hello. awesome. Hi. Um, speaking I just wanted to thank you guys for coming out here. Um, believe it or not, um, Elastic TV slash Make Make has been like my dream place to work since um, I discovered that they made the Westworld title That's sequence. awesome. So yeah. having you guys at the school that I go, go to, it's just like a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, and then also, um, in regards to career opportunities, would you say that 
the residencies is the right way to go about um, working for Make Make or? Are you, are you, so just so I know, you're, yes. you're currently a student here now? Yes. And when are you graduating? Next year. Oh, that's perfect. I think you're, are, you're local, so you're coming here every day. I, I think um, we should, we'll chat after this, but I think for anybody who's interested, we do have kind of summer internship programs that uh, we offer as well that aren't um, a residency per se, but for someone who's local who can come in and do a regular internship, I think that's an opportunity for you. Um, I would definitely, I'll, we'll, we'll give you our information and um, if there's any questions you have about kind of what to do for demo reels, or any, anybody here really, if, if you guys have questions for demo reels or kind of process or who to contact or you know things like that, um, we're more than happy to help in any way we can. Yeah, demo so reels, yeah. quality over quantity. Yeah. 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 One but yeah, for sure, there's there's inter regular internships that you can definitely apply for. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, I think we had one right here, yeah. yes. With the modular organizational structure that you guys seem to have, mm -hmm. with between like Elastic and, um, uh, and all those other different like jacks and such, I'm wondering how does communication and being able to communicate a vision and being able to communicate um, expectations throughout the different modular um, parts of the organization? Like, how does that end up playing out? Mm -hmm. um, additionally, how does the culture, like, play out? Because they're kind of individual, in a way, or, or not. Mm -hmm. um, how do they work together? How does that kind of play? You want to take that? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I, I kind of see it as, like, strike teams, like the, what we call internally the three three D or the CG department is is not one hundred percent elastic. It's not one hundred percent, you know, A five two. There are some specific elastic artists, and there are some specific A five two only artists. But it's it's about figuring out you know the right right peg for the hole, right? So you say, oh, this guy's good at this, this guy's good at that, and then they kind of split off in their own little strike teams, and then those teams are collaboratively communicating together, whether it's on Slack or whether, you know, going to the office every once in a while for a meeting or anything like that. So it's, it's, it's really an extension of how we worked when we were in the office, and it, it becomes like these little, little micro teams. So, and then what's great about it is that you can be working on, you know, an elastic job that's more creative, maybe a main title or a special venue or something, and then the next job kind of fits whatever your kind of major or minor skill set is, and then you can be working on, you know, super integrated, you know, visual effects spot, you know, for A52. So, um, generally the way jobs come in is a job will come in for a specific division, whether it's for JAX or whether it's for Elastic or A52. Um, the way that we approach it is kind of what, what Wilkoff was speaking to is that everybody at the office is in service of whatever creative comes in. So if Jack says, hey, we have this great promo, we need a ton of effects for it, we need this kind of 3D for it, um, they're the ones that are gonna basically run that project and we'll be there to support them in their needs. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very fluid thing where it's, it's, it's amorphous, right? Like they're, 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 aren't, they're, they're not silos at all, right? They're, they're all one giant pot and it just kind of shifts and moves back and forth depending on where the needs are. Um, the great thing is, like, it, like with Jax, right, um, we know all the guys there, right? It, we hang out with them, we eat lunch with them, like we chat about AI and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, so it never feels like they're separate pieces. It always feels like we're kind of just this collective that happens to be working on jobs for Jax or happens to be working on jobs for Elastic. It, it, it's very fluid that way. Um, and then communication-wise, it kind of flows the same way, too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys to be here tonight. Um, I have a question about um, what is the general um, order of the software that you, uh, you use most of the time? Uh, 
as you mentioned, every job has a specific needs. Mm -hmm. Depends on the job, but uh, my question is: is everything is covered? Uh, in a studio after like green screen and blue screen everything goes to after effect and how do you um, how do you uh, break apart the step or level of the job like everything uh, in general goes in after effect and then after that environment make in unreal engine and then models always be in maya how it works most of the time um one of the things that so I used to run the 3D department, and then you know, Wilkoff and I worked together, and now he's taking over. But I think one of the things that I always wanted to instill is it really isn't about, about the package. It's about the project. So we don't go into a project forcing packages into that project to make it happen. We actually go the other way. So we look at the needs of the project first, and then figure out which packages are most suited for that project. So, for instance, um, well, it's also depending on artist availability. You know, if we have someone who's a really great nuke artist and the flame compositors or the After Effects guys are, are, are kind of busy, you know, it's, it's about not being so rigid, like you said. It's just like, okay, this artist is going to be really good at this, and they happen to use After Effects or they happen to use Cinema 4D and Octane. It, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, so for instance, um, for House of the Dragon, for instance, right? Uh, we did an, an extensive s uh, storyboard and, and look dev portion, right? Um, but what we want to do is we want to rely on the strengths of the artist. So we have all these great designers, 3D designers, and they basically can generate still frames really quickly using Cinema and Octane because it's that's their preferred package. Um, so. It, throughout that process, the beginning portion of that process was building look frames and selling ideas and setting a tone with Cinema and Octane and the artists that are really strong with that. But for something like Fluid Sims and things like that, Octane has a harder time rendering that stuff. So once we've established this look, we then take that idea and build it in Maya. Because we have Houdini people and the, the I.O. between Maya and Houdini is really seamless and it's really easy. So what we're trying to do is f leverage the artists and put them in a position to succeed and lean on their strengths and make sure that it's all in service to kind of this final project that we're trying to finish. It isn't about necessarily um, building a, a rigid pipeline and forcing all the projects into it. Because I think you're always going to run into issues where, ah, like it could have been easier if we did it this way, you know? Like this stuff's hard enough. We don't want to make it yeah. any harder than it needs to be, you know? So we're trying to kind of figure out the most efficient way to get the best result as quickly as possible. So we, in our facility, we use uh, the designers, the 3D designers use a lot of Cinema, Octane, and After Effects. Um, we, for the VFX portion, we use Maya, V-Ray, Nuke, uh, and also Heavy Flame. Um, so a lot of the live action stuff is sent through flame so that the client could come into the bay or do a live session and do the grades and that sort of thing. Um, and a lot of Houdini for the and effects then, and Houdini, we're not necessarily doing a lot of rendering in Houdini, we're either pushing that into Maya or into Octane so that, you know, the, uh, the lighting and look dev is, is, is handled by those, yeah. is more cohesive and and you know, there's different types of artists, and the artists that, that we have are really good at effects and blowing stuff up, but not necessarily looked at. So we don't want them to do that if that's you know something yeah. they don't enjoy, and they just like blowing shit up. Yeah. Oh, so can I swear on the internet? Well, you just did. It's all, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, we, we try and be as fluid as possible, and um, you know, we have Maya guys that do design work, and we have Cinema guys that do like do, like we just did a job where we, we did everything in cinema and we were doing stuff with live action plates in cinema. So it really depends on the strength of the artist and the project's requirements. Um, and we try and stay as fluid as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Even it kind of reminds me of one of the first, well, one of the effects jobs I worked on, I did on the Game of, one season eight of Game of Thrones, we did a teaser and we did all the ice effects oh, and yeah. stuff yeah, in yeah. Houdini. And then we had Joao who was Maya and did all the fire stuff in Fume effects in Maya. Yeah. You know, and it came out great. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah it's, it's, 
It's leveraging the talent. Yeah, yeah for sure. Because it is, it's about the artist. It's not about the, the hardware or the software, right? It's just a pencil. So. Uh, hi, thank you for breaking the process. So, would you guys be comfortable with uh, sharing the budget for the Ica commercial and Game of Thrones credits? And also, well, I'm sure it would have like multiple factors, influences like the number of hours and the strength of the actors and uh, the level of detailing. How do you guys project the numbers? Um, I can't talk about budgets. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but in terms of how to project that stuff. I mean, Wilkoff will say the yeah, same I mean, thing. Yeah, I mean, I do this all day, so. It's, it's budgeting is, is as much an art form as actually making the stuff. Because, I mean, there's so many factors that go into each of these projects, right? Like, you, you, can't, you can't know everything before yeah. it actually happens, yeah. you, you know? But you do it enough, right, and you're like, you know, the little, your, your little spidey sense goes off and says, you know, like that thing right there, that thing could yeah. be, that could be two more weeks easily. Um, so there's a lot of that. Or like this guy is really good and he can light a, a shot in a day, but not everybody's like him. So I'm going to say three days to yeah. light a shot, <laughs> you know. But it's, <laughs> it's kind of, it's not necessarily worst case scenario, but it's, it's relying on your experience to be able to say, the last time we did something similar, it took this many hours or days or weeks or whatever. Um, and then kind of you use that as your barometer. And the more jobs you bid out and the more jobs you actually are involved in, your barometer gets really tight, right? So, you, you know, the first time you do it, you're going to fluctuate quite a bit. Like the first <laughs> couple of jobs I bid out, I was like all over the place. Yeah. But, you know, as you do it, you start to get the sense of how things should go, you know. Um, They're like, Kirk, your bid is five times more than what they have. Like, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, let me take another stab at that. <laughs> and let's bring it down. So, you know, but a, a lot of it too is communication, right? Um, and this leans into the creative portion of it. It's understanding what the creative intent behind the project is, right? So it's not just about this task, this task, this task. It's about what is the director actually looking to get out of these shots? Because at the end of the day, maybe it's a simple shot. Maybe he doesn't want to spend a ton of time on it. And, in, in his flow, in his edit, it's a small portion of this bigger picture. So you don't want to bid some crazy number for that little thing, but you have to understand how that little effect or that little portion in the bid fits into kind of the overarching uh, spot as a whole, you know? And, and creatively, what purpose does it serve? So those are the kind of things, like the more you do it, the, the, the easier it gets to kind of catch those things and understand what the intent behind shots are. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Hello. Well, I think. Hey guys. Uh, the cube is. Where's the thank cube? Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, showing up. Uh, this is awesome uh, for what you guys showed. My favorite was the, the IKEA commercial. I just have a question for each of you gentlemen. Um, if it was absolutely blue sky, and you could define yourself by one dream project, for example you know, the inspiration of Star Wars. What one project would you imagine and absolutely define your entire career around if it was Blue Sky? Well, that's a, like one, that's one a project big question. that defines my personal career or just a, a pinnacle of what I... Um, any, any one project, let me see if I get this right. So is any, any project that you would want to work on that would be a career changer for you? or a, a career definer, say. See, so this is a complex question because my, um, my thoughts on this has it's changed. Has changed. Yeah. So um, I really wanted to work on Lord of the Rings. Mm. And it was really like, like that, be part of that would be awesome. But, you know, and then as kind of time went along, and even stuff that we're involved with now, like there's a project that I can't talk about and uh, I had to bid it and I'm like, Kirk, do not tell me anything about the stuff that you're gonna see because I wanna enjoy the movie when it comes out. I, 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 I'm still a fan and I, I, and I wanna enjoy it. Like, so I, I actually like not being a part of features anymore because 
like X-Men, I saw that movie like 5,000 times, right? And, and all of its various, you know, level of undress, right? And um, so, like now, like back in the day, like I would have loved to work on Lord of the Rings. Um, but now I'm happy just going to the movies and, and enjoying, enjoying it as, as a fan. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, think, I think my answer might be sort of along the same lines as Wilcoff's, is that, you know, I, I think when I first got into the industry, you know, I, I said it a thousand times tonight, but you know, you know what I wanted to work on, Star Wars and big movies, and it was, it was always like having the, the one dream project that I was working towards, and it was off in the distance, and once I got there, I'd, I'd have it, I'd finally accomplish my goal, my dream that I had since I was like four, right? And like that would make me feel, feel fulfilled and happy. And I think what I've realized during my journey here at Make Make is that it's, you know, like I, I don't think it's about any one particular project. It's more about, it's maybe a little cliche, but the journey and the process. And I've really fallen in love with just what I do day to day and like growing as an artist, right? I, when, I, when I went about it, I, I live my life my first few years in the industry with just trying to get that dream project, you know, and it, I didn't, I, it wasn't, for me, it didn't work well as an, as an artist. It, it wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling. It was always, I was always like grinding and it made, made my job, it made effects in 3D and animation. It made it feel like a job, you know, not a passion. And um, yeah, it was only the last few years that I realized is that, oh, I don't need to have that one big goal, you know, it's just like, it's more, like I said, about the journey, about growing as an artist and, you know, watch, look at the work that my coworkers are doing and feeling inspired. And, you know, it's like that, I guess that would be it for me. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, I, I mean, like Wilkoff said, it, it's changed over time, right? Um, but I think right now, you know, I just want to, I mean, there's no real one IP that I'm like drawn to where I feel like Star Wars, right? I I I'm, I don't have to work on the next Star Wars movie I or the next Star Wars series, are. huh? I don't know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I enjoy them, but I think for me, it's uh, I mean, it could be as simple as the next the next main title I work on, right? Where I can put something unique into it and have people want to step through it frame by frame, you know, like, like to me, that's where the enjoyment is. It's, it's, it's giving something to the fans to actually enjoy, you know, um, it isn't about an IP or a movie or anything like that. It's, it's really about kind of, um, I don't know, creatively pushing myself to, to deliver something that, that people love, you know, it's, it's not really. It's making other people be like, man, I wanted to work on that. I mean, you know, right? right? Like, I mean, to some level, that's kind of being ahead of the curve. I, I want people to, it's a rewatch, right? Like, if, if I make something and people only watch it once, like, that's great, but I'm kind of bummed, right? I want people to watch it over and over and over again and obsess over it, right? I want to be able to give them something that has that much depth. Um, so that's kind of what I would want to do as my next big thing. Okay. Uh, my voice for the first time is odd. Uh, I'm curious about the uh, IKEA commercial. I'm a I'm not a digital artist or anything. I've recognized the uh, all the programs you talked about. I kind of know what some of them do. But say like someone who did you when that IKEA commercial come to you with the director? Did he start out with you at the very beginning, or did he come with an idea already, and did he already shoot the uh, all the live action stuff, and that was parts of the pieces he gave to you to put together in the, uh, the final process? Or did you, were you always involved at the very beginning? Yeah, so generally how it works in advertising is you'll have um, a, a creative agency and they'll concept and sell ideas through to like an Ikea client. And then Ikea client will be like, yes, I want to do that. And then what they do is then they're like, great, we're going to find directors to take our little snippet and then put their own creative spin and expound upon that. So then they basically make these pitch decks where it's a bunch of pictures, 
you know, very well written, like we're gonna tell this amazing story through time and space and, you know, in a world where there's only... Whatever. In a world. In a world <laughs> where floating planets in the sky means amazement. Um, so they bring, they bring this kind of creative vision and they block it out with, you know, research art, right? And sometimes they have some budgets for, um, you know, concept art and stuff like that. And then that gets passed around and we say, oh, that's gonna cost about this much. And then if they're awarded that spot, then we become just like internally, we become this little strike team that we all then work together. They create storyboards, we give some input on it. And, and then the input that we give is, you know, depending on the, on the level of the relationship is like, hey, creatively can go this way or technically this is how you wanna achieve your thing. And then we communicate with the production department, live action shoots, we're not normally on set so that we can say, oh, you're gonna, you need to move this over there or, you know, that's working great. And then, so it's a, it's a partnership throughout the whole thing. And the storyboards and animatics are as much as a guide for us to do the finish thing, as well as communicating to the client of how it's gonna look going along too, because then there's a whole, there's all these different levels of approval and you know, there's, there's a fine art of communicating and showing progress and be able to explain it that, that moves the whole process forward in a, in a creative kind of seamless way. Hello guys, um, I wanted to say thank you so much for the event. It was super cool and very insightful, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I think that last question kind of answered what I was gonna ask, but it's all good, I'm gonna ask anyways. Um, yeah. Um, basically, um, how much creative control do you guys have in these projects? So in the sense that you, yes, you wanna make something to please, the client, but at the same time, you're artists, right? Like you have this vision that you want to show the world. So how much, uh, yeah. No, 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 I mean, it, it, it varies. I mean, it, it just depends. Like Elastic, if we do a job through Elastic, we're, we're the creatives, right? And then sometimes we're, we're just the, the, the vessel that helps channel the, the vision. I, I think the, at the end of the day, no matter what job we're working on, um, there, I there is this desire to input our creative kind of uh, voice into the process. Um, like Wilkoff was saying, for, for jobs that come in for us to direct, like, like Game of Thrones or you know, those kind of main titles, we're responsible for building those ref decks, building the concept, um, they don't, they generally don't come to us with an idea. They'll basically say, here's a bunch of scripts, here's some of the shows, you know, we need a main title, like, go, you know, go at it. So then it's up to us to come up with kind of solutions, creative solutions for them to then take back, digest, and then figure out which direction they want to go. And then it becomes this um, really nice creative back and forth of, well, you know, we kind of need to, we kind of need to focus on this part of it because that's kind of where the story, we want to emphasize on the story, right? And so then it, it becomes a, a, a back and forth of what is the creative intent, right? And then for jobs like Ikea, right, where there's an external director that comes in and we're there to help them achieve their goals, we need to understand what their creative intent is. So it's all sort of related. It's just the way that you go about it, right? Like, there, there is always going to be. Uh, yeah, there's always creativity within the rails, right? Yeah. So you're always going to have some sort of extreme. Some rails are just wider than others. But right? there's, there's like you know, just like the shot that I was talking about that that Dustin put together with the treehouse, like that. That's an amazing, creative-looking shot that wasn't ever boarded like that, right? And the tone and everything like that. So there's, there's, there's different levels of create creativeness creativity um, in different situations. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think 
think even uh, in my role as an effects artist on the, the last thing I worked on, I worked on the Snapchat job, and there was this mayonnaise rocket, you know? So we had to, I had to design the exhaust for the mayonnaise rocket, and the, the, the concept art, the, the art that they gave me was like, okay, we got to go plasma, here's some fire stuff, here's this, this, this we like, and then the uh, Jesse, the flame artist, just like, okay, have at it. And so yeah. I just kind of <laughs> like- Figure it out. Figure it <laughs> out, yeah. And then it was just kind of like, I worked with Jesse and you know June, the other Houdini artist, and we kind of discovered what the effect was and what the overall look, so it was pretty cool. Yeah, there's, crea there, there's, there's opportunities to be creative at every level, but you know, it's work for hire to some degree, so yeah. there's always gonna be some constraints. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it too, it's, it's, about, it's about what what roles that you're you're taking on for the project as mm -hmm. well, right? So, you know, uh, for me as a CG lead, a lot of the a lot of the, the the creativity that I was able to put into a project happened during the shoot and later, right? Whereas as a, as a as a creative director now, almost all the creativity that I put into a project happens before, right? right? So, it it's just different parts, right? And different kind of areas of focus and that sort of thing. Um, but, but, yeah, hopefully that answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Final question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, so thanks again for taking us through your process and everything. Um, it's kind of in the vein of these two questions, but it's more about the refinement process. Because, you, you know, you have, you have to, for example, make a mayonnaise rocket and you have these different looks. like. How do you go from, like, what does it look like? Are you doing dailies to say, oh, I tried this plasma, what do you think of this? Uh, you know, going through to testing out those ideas to the actual final project, product that, like, makes it into the end title sequence or commercial or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Go for it, Mike. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, I come from the match move background, which is like, it's either right or wrong, you know? So, like, I'm still kind of adjusting to this, but uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to get used to the idea that there's not a right or wrong way, right? There's <laughs> many different possibilities, and it's, 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 uh, it's been a ride. Um, but yeah, I mean, so far, like, in my experience, it's like, we, we have dailies, and um, you might have, like, one or two different versions, maybe three or four different versions, you know, of an effect or different direction. And then, um, yeah, I mean, the, the notes always vary, and you know, sometimes the the, per the people, the team that I'm working with, like they have a very particular and specific direction that they're going in, and so their notes will, you know, they'll, they'll help. It's kind of like they help guide, kind of like guide me, you know, in the direction that they want to go in. And then uh, sometimes on some jobs, it's a little more free flowing. It's uh, you know, and it's kind of like, oh well, this is cool. What if we, like on the Snapchat thing, it was I did a fire, and then you know. Jesse, the flame guy, was like, oh, this is cool. Uh, w what if we add smoke? So then I had to add, you know, then we added in smoke. And then he's like, oh, okay, well, no, the smoke doesn't look right. Or, you know, make it make it streakier, or, you know. And then he's like, oh, well, let's add in sparks. I added in sparks. And then, you know, so, yeah, um, that's, I don't know. Did I answer yeah. the question? Did yeah. that count? Also, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you have to do the wrong thing to get to the right thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, um, yeah. And then and in production, one of the, you know, this, this will show my age, but back in the day, there was a concept called wedging, and that was just more for kind of film outs, when we would actually send stuff to film and look at it in the screening room, and they would, you would vary the exposure just a little bit, and they would run a, a small little part of that, that clip at different exposure levels, and then they would look at it and be like, okay, this is the exposure level that we want, and then they would run the whole thing. So we commonly, you know, ask people, okay, take this effect and wedge it out, which means, give me 10 different versions that are very similar, do it for 15 or 20 frames, and let's see what it looks like so that you're not spending an inordinate amount of time of 300 frame sim, I gotta do that 10 different times and, and vary it up a little bit. So it's, it's about learning, learning um, you know, a process to the craft is, is, is the other aspect of things and, and learning a, a, a problem solving or, or a methodology that you can kind of apply to every situation. Yeah, for, for a lot of what we do too, the wedging thing is, I mean, we do that for lighting as well. Like, but I think the, the, the initial step is basically, here's, here's your reference, like, go at it, come back with two or three versions of this thing, right? And 
just play with it and see what you can come up with. And they don't have to be similar, they could be really different. And then it's pulling the things we like from each of those and coming down to uh, something else and then wedging that out. And it's basically just doing that over and over again until we can kind of refine this idea and this look to a point where everybody kind of enjoys it and likes it. Um, it's and a then long go process. back and use the first version. <laughs> Never. <laughs> I've never done that. No, no, no. I didn't say you. I said uh -huh. other people. Yeah. But it, I think it, it is. It's, it's a really long process. And, you know, the more, I mean, the more you can iterate, the more you can iterate, the more versions you can put out, the better it's going to be at the end of the day, you know? Um, yeah. And it doesn't have to be perfect right out of the bat. Like, yeah. you know, and I think there's also a thing it, you know, there's collaboration, like, you know, coming from a design background is like, uh, I, was, I was taught never design in a vacuum because if you design in a vacuum and you don't have any external input, you're, you're, you're stuck and you're in your little bubble and, and you become married to that first idea where if somebody else is looking at it and they're like, oh, like, let me sketch on top of your sketch. And they're like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then you go back and be like, oh, I'm going to sketch on top of my, your sketch and that was on top of my sketch. And, and the next thing you know, you're, you're springboarding back and forth and then your end product is something that you would have never done on your own without some of those external kind of forces and feedback. And so part of it is, you know, as an artist, everyone is like, you know, I'm, I'm as good as my last element or my last commercial or whatever. And criticism is tough, right? Taking criticism is like, you know, for some reason they're like, they don't like my element, so I'm a horrible person. You know, you have to, as a professional artist, you have to learn how to detach from that and learn from the feedback to make what you're doing not better, but fit what the ask is and, and not be the self-deprecating artist that, that I am and that we all are and just be like, oh, I'm horrible. I can't light this, you know? And, and, you know, and just be open to the pup process, be open to criticism and, and, and take, and then, I wouldn't even say criticism, but I would say notes, right? And, you know, that's, that's, that's something that I think is really good for any new artist because everybody's going to have an opinion about what you're going to do. And it's, it's not a personal reflection of you. It's, it's the, pr the part of the creative process is bouncing back and forth to get to something that's more than the sum of the original part. I think that that was my biggest probably growing pain moving from match moving over into effects was because Matt fixed the match moving it's either right or wrong and so if I got an email about a track I did it means, meant that I did it wrong you know and I had to go back and, and you're fix a horrible it. artist, and I'm a horrible <laughs> yeah. artist you're and horrible I, and I should feel bad and uh, <laughs> but then you know with the, so when I got over to effects you know I had my eye was my eye was trained really well in tracking to notice any little small little slip, any little movement. So I came at it with a very perfectionistic mindset and you know, they told me to do like a fire effect or something. And so I would be like, okay, I, I worked at a fire effect, but if one little small little thing was off, it was like, I have to fix this thing. I'd spend an extra day or two just trying to get this little thing I done. remember, yeah. so, so he did a water effect. We're doing uh, a, uh, I think it was for Bloomhouse. Yeah. The Bloomhouse Open. Yeah, yeah. So we did the Bloomhouse Open. The, they revised it. So he did the water effect in the bathtub. And uh, he was doing that where he was like, he was like trying to make it perfect straight out the gate. And I'm like, dude, just show me, just show me any, just yeah. show me stuff. Just throw stuff out there and let's see where it fits in this, in the yeah. kind of in the spectrum of like, does this work? Does this not work? And it very, it, it kind of became this thing where it's like, okay, let's try this. Let's wedge this. And you know, and that whole process. But I think the most important thing to take away from all of this is to ask the question. Like, yeah. ask questions. Don't, don't make it about you. Like, yeah. turn it around and ask questions of the director or yeah. the creative director or your yeah. lead of like, yeah. well, what is it about this that needs to be improved? What is, you know, if you don't ask those questions, yeah. you're never going to get there. So yeah. that would be. Yeah. And as a new artist, it's like 15 minute rule. Like, you know, if you can't figure something out or if something, you know, you're having an issue, ask someone a question. I would much rather stop anything in my day to answer a question than to have someone toil away on something that's not, you know, that's not working, they can't figure out, you know, a technical issue or a creative issue, 
And then, again, the self-deprecating artist, then they start to spiral and be like, I'm a horrible artist. And, you know, it just goes, and it, and it spirals down where VFX is a team sport, right? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, there's not one guy making, you know, all the movies. So, like, rely on your team. And on that note, I think self-deprecation aside, uh, we can work on giving you a little bit of an ego boost. Everybody give it up for Make Me. <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank you all for tuning in live. If you're interested, I want to know what we can do for you. Go ahead and send us an email at admissions at noman.edu. If you're interested on what's going to be coming up here live, you can check us out on all of our socials. And one more time, give it up for Make Make, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you.